All right, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to our fall semester uh, Charles Sappen Field Lecture. Uh, as I always say when I see our lecture hall this full, uh, looks like we're going to need a bigger boat. It is really wonderful to have you all here this afternoon taking a break from your studios for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, Mary Miss. Mary Miss has reshaped the boundaries between sculpture, architecture, landscape architecture, planning, and installation art by articulating a vision of the public sphere where it is possible for an artist to address the issues of the time. She has developed a framework called City as Living Lab for making issues of sustainability tangible. Trained as a sculptor, uh, her work creates uh, situations emphasizing the history of the site, its ecology, or aspects of the environment that have gone unnoticed. Mary Miss has developed uh, close collaborations with architects, planners, engineers, ecologists, and public administrators on projects as diverse as the creation of a temporary memorial around the perimeter of Ground Zero, marking the predicted flood level of Boulder, Colorado, revealing the history of Union Square subway station in New York City, or turning a seaward treatment plant into a public space. Very diverse work. A recipient of many awards, Mary Miss has been subject of exhibitions at Harvard University Art Museum, Brown University Gallery, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, the Architecture Association in London, Harvard University Graduate School of Design, and the Denoir's Art uh, Center. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Mary Miss. I'm really be glad to be in a place where um, you know that you can't drink the water from the White River, but you can eat the White River. Uh, somebody did this great uh, layout of cupcakes, uh, I think, showing the White River. Um, you are, I see some of you are still munching on it. Uh, some, it's a place I've looked at uh, pretty closely over the years. Um, I keep talking about map making. I can't get away from it. I can't help myself. Uh, there was um, years ago, a short piece that was written by uh, an Argentine writer named Borges. And I went back and read it recently. And he didn't really say what I thought he said. But I've elaborated uh, on it over the years and made it what I wanted it to be. Um, the text was uh, describing an emperor who wanted to map his kingdom. And he sent his map maker out. And the map maker made a map of the kingdom that was as large as the city. And uh, the king took a look at it and said, no, this isn't detailed enough. So the map maker met, went out and did it again, and did it the size of the province. And the king looked at it and said, no, it's still not good enough. It's not, not detailed. I don't know enough yet. And so the map maker went out and made a map that was point for point the map of the kingdom. And finally, the guy was satisfied. I think it takes somebody with maybe something like uh, OCD to want to do that. But uh, it's something that's really interested me over the years, how to really show a, a, a territory in as much detail as possible, not just for the detail itself, but as a means of engaging people. So. I'm going to kind of show you how I've mapped a territory for myself with my own work, uh, leading it uh, up to where 
I've been recently, which is only a couple hours south in uh, Indianapolis, uh, starting at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Um, uh, in the mid-80s, I did a project along the uh, Hudson River, and uh, I had lived not far from the edge of the river for maybe 15 years already when I did this project. And at the time, uh, Manhattan was really a frustrating place because you were on an island, but you couldn't get to the river. So I uh, was invited to do this collaborative project with uh, Susan Child, a landscape architect, and Stan Ekstedt, an architect. And uh, my thought was that I wanted people to really be able to smell the river, hear it, uh, get their feet wet. There's a part of this that if you walk to the north end and the tide is high, it's, the water splashes up and, and catches you. Uh, at this uh, south end here, uh, if you're standing here at high tide and boats go by, there's a sloshing sound that as though it's as though you've got your ear to the river. It's so loud. Uh, but I just wanted people to be able to really see and feel and smell the river. Um, there were these pilings that we placed along uh, the side of the river. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a different thing than you're looking at. Uh, there you see the city uh, behind. This was just south of what had been the World Trade Center. And then these pilings were, uh, uh, there were all of these old piers that had burned down that were left along the western edge of Manhattan. And so we needed a barrier to keep boats from hitting against the seawall here. So I, want, I really like that idea of visually tying the land and the sea together. Um, one of the things that has been interesting to me, and I, I'll just introduce the idea briefly, uh, as visual thinkers, as artists, designers, landscape architects, architects, I really feel like uh, there is a tremendous role that we can play in cities. I think we're marginalized in the public view, but we sometimes marginalize ourselves. And it's really interesting for me to look back at New York City decades after doing some of my work there or around there. And it, it isn't as though people always come up and shake my hand and say, thank you for introducing a language. Uh, into the public sphere, but it's been interesting to me to note that the planting, for insta instance, or the blue lights that we used here at the South Cove have proliferated along the edge. There was something that we started there. Uh, the footprints of the new uh, World Trade Center Memorial recall a project that I did that was a hole cut in the ground. Um, there's a framing uh, device up on the High Line that is reminiscent of a project that I did that was framing uh, a path into the woods at Lake Placid years ago. And I actually didn't put two and two together until a graduate student uh, did an interview with me. And he said, how does it feel to uh, have made this kind of, uh, had this kind of effect on, on the city? And it's not as though the reason you want to it's not to brag, have bragging rights about this. Oh, I did this and others are, are. But I just think it's really important for all of you to remember that you have got a really important role that you can play in your communities, in our culture, in our larger culture. Um, so just to keep going with this, uh, the kind of things I was thinking about, there was a project that I was uh, asked to do in Des Moines, Iowa. And there we were trying to do a demonstration wetland in the middle of a city. Uh, there was a derelict pond and we planted uh, grasses around it. We worked with the parks department, with the science center. And the idea was that we wanted to be able to take people around the edge of this wetland and show them how it worked, what it looked like. Uh, there was a place where you could sit down at eye level and look out uh, you know, at the level of the water. And, you know, when I talk about a visceral experience, uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm looking at, something that gets you into a physical and emotional place that you haven't been before. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to do projects like this, uh, this kind of eye-level view uh, of the water, but they don't happen so easily. 
Uh, this was another project that was done in Finland. There was a symposium looking at our natural resources and the dimin diminishing resources. And I made these uh, seven long troughs uh, that were attached to the base of trees and uh, acted as mirrors for the trees uh, and just kind of calling attention to this ubiquitous uh, kind of tree that's growing all over Finland. Um, but in each of these cases, I'm just trying to get you to, to note something that otherwise you might be taking, uh, taking for granted, like the, the wetland or like these trees. Um, a few years ago, I started on a project for the North Carolina Museum of Art. And there was a really uh, a detention pond that was in very bad shape. Excuse me, I'll go back one. Um, and they have built, since built a new building, and they had to handle all the stormwater runoff. And so um, I wanted to do something. I worked with a hydrologist uh, and to try and figure out how we could filter the water that was going to be going into that pond. And uh, Again, with this notion of, yes, we could have just planted the edge, uh, I really wanted to uh, break it up into terraces so that I could call out the plant material that you would actually find in this kind of wetland. But also, I really wanted to celebrate the water leaving the site. And on the, uh, this next slide, you see this, um, this is just an image that uh, is from a, I think it's actually from a dam in California. But I had seen these on, on some sites I had visited uh, for sewage treatment plants. Uh, I had seen these devices that create a hole in the water. And I really thought that it would be a wonderful thing if you could bring people to this pond and then have the water disappear in such a, a notable way. Unfortunately, many of these projects that I end up working on don't happen, uh, partially because of that role that I mentioned, uh, the way uh, people see art and artists. And it's, you know, when you get to the artwork, if you're running low on money, eliminate that first. So uh, even an art museum like the North Carolina Museum of Art felt free to uh, not build that project. Uh, although they had someone else execute it a couple of years later. Um, but there was the kind of growing frustration I was having at coming up with projects, uh, designing things that would always be eliminated as that kind of tail end of the arts budget got cut off projects. Um, so I started thinking initially on a park I was working on as a collaborative project in Orange County. It was a 1,300 acre park. And I wondered how artists and designers could be involved in the park for the life of the park, not just at the opening day. And I came up with a kind of a program called uh, Park as Living Laboratory, Sustainability Made Tangible Through the Arts. And the idea was that there was going to be a research and residency center where artists and designers would have access to historians or sociologists or ecologists or uh, soil experts, and that they would do projects that would make visible uh, ways that people could reconsider the environment. Could the park become not just a bucolic place to get away, but could it become a place where people would intimately understand, come to understand a new relationship between themselves and the environment. And that was really an important issue in Southern California as we were trying to build a brand new 1,300 acre park, which was going to take a lot of water to uh, bring it to life. That project disintegrated. I, I hope to mention regularly that collaboration is one of the most important ideas I have about working, but some collaborations don't work, and that one fell apart. So uh, in thinking about uh, what to do next, I decided to take those ideas from the park as a living laboratory and apply them to cities. 
And I worked with a colleague to kind of take this idea and develop it further. And we said, how could you look at social and economic and environmental sustainability? And really, through collaborative projects, make those issues very tangible. And uh, it's, I, just as a kind of arbitrary way of breaking up the issues, we said you could look at infrastructure or natural systems or social programs. And they could be done on a large scale or on a very small scale. And the image was that you, know, you would be able to do uh, temporary things or, or, or uh, much larger infrastructure projects. But it was really trying to deal with the idea that cities have these tremendous issues that they have to deal with. So I, there are some diagrams that I did. If it takes you know, 30 years to actually get the air cleaner in New York City, how could you get those issues out on the street and make them accessible to people in a short period of time? There, I know in New York City, and I would presume in many other places, uh, there are great ideas that are discussed interdepartmentally between Department of Transportation and City Planning and Parks Department. But people down at ground level often don't even know that those discussions are going on. And I really would presume, I do presume, that things cannot just be fixed from the top down. It really is going to take the engagement of the citizens of the community to make these issues really uh, uh, come to, to pass, to get, them, uh, get things to work differently. So uh, in this City is Living Lab document that I did, I tried to uh, show people what I had in mind uh, by when I said make uh, sustainability tangible. And this is a project that was done in Boulder, Colorado, uh, showing the flood level of Boulder Creek. Uh, I spent time in Colorado when I was growing up, and although it doesn't seem uh, you know, you think Colorado isn't exactly, it's not like you're thinking of New Orleans. But Boulder, as many of other towns and s small cities in Colorado, is at the mouth of a canyon. And it just will take one heavy rainstorm, and there are about maybe 130 of these cloud bursts every summer. If one of them occurs at the top of Boulder Canyon, there could be a devastating flood in the city. So the city uh, government you know, is saying to people, well, look, this is a big problem. But when there is an, something that's outside of memory, something that you haven't experienced, it's really hard to imagine it. It's hard to put yourself in that place. So I said, let me do a project uh, called Connect the Dots, Mapping the High Water of Boulder Creek. And so I put 300 of these blue uh, uh, disks up on the infrastructure, the trees, the, the bridges, uh, throughout the, the central corridor of Boulder. And sometimes those marks were ankle high, and at other times they were 18 feet in the air. And you could actually you know, connect the dots, measure your, you know, your body in relationship to that mark, and really get a very uh, visceral idea of what was meant by that flood. So that if a flood is to occur, people are going to take it seriously. You, you know, one of the things that I'm not used to, which I'm getting used to, is the idea of evaluation. And people ask me, did this really work? I don't know because there was no evaluation done. But the city of Boulder, this was a temporary project that was part of an exhibition. And it was supposed to be up for three months. The city of Boulder decided to keep it up for a year. They found it to be a very effective way of people understanding what this meant. But I'll say a bit more about this kind of evaluation issue as we go forward. Um, in the City is Living Laboratory framework, another kind of uh, project is looking at infrastructure. And this was a proposal that was done for a sewage treatment plant in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the, it was an existing plant. And uh, my part of this project was to figure out how we could make people not want to just make this plant disappear. There's th this is a very wealthy suburb of Washington, DC, just across the Potomac River. Uh, Al Gore at least used to have a house right at the top of the, the ridge overlooking this plant. 
And as the engineers were starting this $400 million upgrade of the plant, all the neighbors said, we don't want to see it. And I thought, well, gee, how could we make people really see it? How could we make this a public place and bring people into the plant, make it a public space that people could visit, and also let people understand the relationship of their daily activities, that plant and the Chesapeake Bay. So uh, the idea that I had was to do a diagram of the site uh, so that if you were driving by, you could follow that black and white dotted line and uh, actually see how the liquid process played out step by step and how the solid waste uh, part of the uh, plant uh, proceeded. And there are these very huge uh, pipes underground that bring the effluent uh, to the site. I took these, uh, not actually taking sections of them, but the same size as that pipe. And the idea was to embed it into the surrounding fence. And in the previous uh, slide, you remember seeing numbers called out, but as you drive by, you would be able to see step by step what was happening at each of those points in the plant. There was also a digester, one of these huge round tanks that you see uh, at sewage treatment plants that was abandoned, and we wanted to make that the public space that people would meet to go on tours of the plant. And then at the very end, we wanted to show people how the water comes out as clean water and really celebrate its re-entrance. Now, this was another, as opposed to the Boulder Project, which was the 300 blue uh, discs, this was a very large scale project, which once again, the, the plant engineers went over budget by 100%, and so the art part of the project was canceled. I felt like it was really bad math and you know bad value that they were uh, thinking of things this way because there are at least 40 of these plants letting water out into the Chesapeake Bay daily in the, this area. And you know, if people could begin to appreciate and understand and have a personal relationship with a sewage treatment plan, not just see it as something that they want to hide away, uh, maybe there could be a, a different feeling about, uh, about the infrastructure that supports our lives. Um, another project to talk about this idea of social sustainability was something that I did in uh, a project that was done in Delhi, India, that was again a temporary installation. Uh, there is a, a park in a, a working class neighborhood there were a lot of factories uh, in this neighborhood until uh, about two years before the Commonwealth Games. It's adjacent to a park that has a beautiful uh, 17th century Mughal pavilion in it. And um, as they were preparing for the Commonwealth Games, Delhi wanted to have clean air, and so they uh, closed all the factories. There was a 400-year-old vegetable market in the neighborhood, and uh, really, did not pay much attention to the ground level issue of the sustainability of the neighborhood. So that this really functioning working class neighborhood had pretty much disintegrated. So I wanted to kind of bring out the importance of not only having that aerial view of the place, but really thinking about, about that ground level effect that, uh, that's happening as plans are made for cities. Um, so in the the space in front of this beautiful old pavilion, um, there was garbage, I mean, about two feet of uh, garbage, you know, filling this whole space. And I said, I would like to plant an Ayurvedic garden. And Ayurvedic plants are the, the basis of the medicinal system that's very frequently used in India. And the archaeologist who controlled the site said, no way, you can't plant anything. And I'm kind of scratching my head thinking, oh, you can have garbage, but you can't have plants. That's uh, interesting. But uh, not to be deterred, I decided to, uh, thinking of textiles, uh, rugs or tapestries that have the look of a garden, I decided to lay a pattern out on this site. And in the middle of each of these uh, uh, elements was uh, a, something that told about uh, the particular uses of uh, a single plant, and so a hundred different plants were described. 
uh, in this area. And um, at the base of the pavilion, we had the actual plants that we couldn't put in the ground. Uh, we had about 2,000 varieties of, of plants uh, for people to see. And then speakers came and talked to uh, people in the neighborhood uh, over the period of the installation about which plants they could grow themselves on their roofs or on their windowsills uh, and what they were good for. Um, there was this portable park that uh, there were several of these that were taken out into the neighborhood and shopkeepers would put them out each day and it told when the speakers were going to be available in the park. Um, so uh, I'm showing these examples to talk about this, this kind of broad definition of sustainability, whether it's environmental or social uh, or dealing with the infrastructure. So it was great to kind of have this idea of doing the city as a living laboratory, but people would say, I went around and started meeting people in New York City at the, in some of the departments because I wanted to convince them that they were really missing out, that they didn't realize you know, what a great contribution visual thinkers could be. And they, say, they were saying, like, what, what is this about? We don't understand. Yes, you, you're talking about the city as a living laboratory, but how does that happen? Um, at the same time, I had been working uh, for almost a decade on a project in Indianapolis uh, with the Indianapolis Museum of Art to create a walkway between the museum and their uh, new art nature preserve. And every time I would do a plan, there would be some financial crisis and they'd say, oh, it's costing too much, we can't do it. So I was working for a couple of years with Marlon Blackwell, uh, the architect, and Ed Blake, the landscape architect, two of the most, you know, best practitioners, the most wonderful collaborators I've come across. But once again, uh, the budget got cut and uh, the thing that I'd been working on was, was canceled. So I said, okay, here's my chance to, um, they, they did say we have to cancel your project, but would you like to come back and do something else? And I wasn't too sure after three cancellations of three different versions of the project that I did want to come back, but I thought about it and I thought, yeah, I'd really like to test these ideas that I've been developing. How do you make it happen? And I'd been looking at the White River um, and because it runs right beside the museum in a big uh, horseshoe. And I thought, how, how could I make this river more apparent to the city? And I, I started investigating and found out more about it. What I knew when I started was that it was very beautiful, very bucolic, and yet it was almost invisible within the city. It had hardly any presence. If you think of cities that have great river fronts, uh, this was not it. You know, this, uh, but as I found out more, uh, the founding uh, people for, of Indianapolis came and they came, I guess, in after a heavy rain in spring and thought they had a really great navigable river, but it turned out it was not navigable. And uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that things haven't developed along the river, as, except in the kind of central business district where factories were using it as the place to uh, dump everything. Um, but this bucolic river was supplying 70% of the drinking water in uh, Indianapolis but it's terribly polluted, and you all know the, you've got the White River up here. So um, I thought, let me look at this, this river and try and find a way to bring it to people's attention. And so uh, the, the IMA, the museum, is located up here, and White River State Park is about six miles to the south. So I, I decided to uh, take this six mile stretch of river and try and look at as many aspects of it as I could. This is up at the IMA property where there's this great bend in the river. Uh, and this used to be a, a farm in here and at a certain point they wanted to do a highway exchange and dug it out and uh, created this lake. Uh, you can imagine uh, what's going to happen at some, or what happens regularly, but uh, sometime or another probably going to lose that uh, edge of the uh, property. But this is the area that they were making into this uh, new 
uh, art nature preserve that they have made into it. But not only was I looking at that, but you know, the rest of the way down the river, uh, I just walked it back and forth. I went and talked to people at city agencies. I wanted to be able to let people know uh, that they were standing on a levee. And, and many people at, in Indianapolis didn't know that they were on a levee, which had been built after a, a really uh, terrible flood in 1913. I wanted people to understand about the uh, ecology of the river, uh, uh, about the history of the river, where there had been a, a, an encampment, uh, a Civil War encampment. Um, I wanted to uh, have people uh, be able to to notice uh, the river and not just see it as kind of a, a, a speck of blue in the background. So, oops, let me go back one here. Um, in trying to figure out uh, how I could do this, now you've seen these big projects like the one for the sewage treatment plant that cost you know several million dollars and which I think are great projects, but since they weren't happening, I really wanted to go towards an idea of something that was more like acupuncture, where you could have points that you get people engaged with. And it was really, you know, coming out of my frustration of coming up with great plans that stay on a shelf and nothing happens. I really wanted to find an immediate way to engage people. And I wanted to find a way to engage them in real space and in real places. And I'm, I love the internet. I wish there had been the internet when I was a kid. I would have, you know, spent all my time looking up, you know, Googling every possible thing. But I still really believe in real places and real spaces. And so I kind of tongue in cheek took the idea of the Google map pin, the red uh, mark uh, that you see in the distance, and uh, came up with the idea of coming, uh, of having a mirror that people could see themselves in but then I could call something out uh, that they could take note of. In other words, I could put that oversized map pin, which was a six inch steel ball, uh, at the point that I wanted them to notice. Uh, I can tell people that this is a, combi a combined sewer outfall. Now, uh, maybe people aren't that interested in it, but they at least they've had it called out to them. Maybe they're more interested in the fish hatchery uh, that I'm pointing out, or maybe they're more interested in a historical uh, thing that I'm noting. But they get to see themselves in relationship to the river. They have the, the opportunity to kind of have that landscape decoded to some extent. Um, so through uh, this six mile corridor, there were about 100 places where we had uh, either just the red ball itself with a number or that you would uh, see the mirror uh, in relationship to the red ball. On the reverse side was a map that showed you how far the project uh, extended so that you could see where you were and you could go further north or south. There was a number that you could dial up and hear a brief description of what it was you're look you were looking at. Um, as I was first starting to work with this on this project, I met this wonderful uh, scientist at uh, the USGS in Indianapolis, uh, Scott Morlath, and he gave me this uh, disc and he said, everything you want to know about the river is on this and here, this will really help. And I'm not a scientist, I'm looking at this, I'm getting really bored, I can hardly make my way through all these pages. It just, uh, you know, it was really nice of him, but uh, you know, I wasn't too interested. I went out uh, several weeks later with Scott, and we walked the area of the, on, of the river and the IMA uh, and the Art and Nature Preserve. And it was so interesting. It was so interesting to be standing on the embankment where he was talking about water filtering through that embankment and the groundwater. It was so interesting to have him point out where the fish hatchery was or the green roof on the garage that I hadn't noticed that's on the grounds of the IMA. So I thought, you know, what if people could stand in these locations and have these descriptions, how to have this, uh, this landscape uh, revealed to them in this very um, explicit but um, direct way. 
So that was kind of the, my thinking behind uh, that. And you know, we put these in many different situations. Here you're seeing the map. Uh, there was a kind of funny thing that happened as you looked into the mirror and aligned the red mark in the distance in the mirror. There's a kind of stippling in the mirror, so it was kind of like sucking that uh, red mark in. Um, so just to show you a few of these different situations that we were uh, looking at, White River State Park, at an overlook uh, on the uh, IMA property. Sometimes these mirrors were in clusters. The USGS uh, put up a weather station uh, that we noted and explained to people. Uh, one of my favorite, I decided to give the museum uh, like measles. We put these uh, three foot diameter red marks uh, on the facade of the museum. And then on the mirror, you could align the, uh, the marks on the mirror that uh, talked about the six uh, water systems that were supporting the building. And on the interior of the entry pavilion, uh, we had a map of uh, the city, a walkable map, um, where people could see where they live in relationship to the river. Um, there was a scientist at Butler University who said early on, if we could just get people to understand that all property is riverfront property, that the river starts at their front door. I, th I just thought that was such a great line, and we really used it as our tagline uh, for the whole project. Uh, but how do you, how do you uh, make something like that real, all property is riverfront property? Well, we applied for a NOAA grant, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and uh, created an app uh, called Track a Raindrop. Uh, and if any of you want to check it out, it's trackaraindrop.org. And it's a web-based app, so you can uh, get it. Um, but what happens is any place within Indianapolis, you can see how uh, a drop of water goes from the location, either that you enter by typing in an address or by GPS. Uh, within that uh, line, sometimes it will be a green line because it means it's in an open a uh, creek or stream, and other times, you know, if it's a purple line, it's within a storm sewer. Uh, the question marks allow, if you click on the question mark, it tells you what the pollutant is that's in that section of the river. Um, there's a, a way to see how the water flows if it's a heavy rain or if it's a, a flood uh, condition. Um, and there are also, uh, uh, place, there are places that you can go to to find out what you can do to uh, help clean the river up. Um, uh, in addition to that, we had a series of public events. There was a 10-day uh, festival about the White River. And the thing that we were saying about this is that uh, during the festival, you can see there, were, uh, there was a parade of, uh, of carts that kids had decorated, but there were also lectures and panels and uh, there was a dance performance. Um, but when I started the project, I said, you know, this isn't an end in itself. What we want this to be is a catalyst for uh, getting people engaged with the river in the city. And the, you didn't really know if that was going to happen. Um, but, you know, we wanted to give them multiple means of access. They could just look in the mirror and see themselves and see the thing named. They could do the dial-up. They could go to the website. They could use the app. Or they could be, you know, go to the performances. But we wanted to give multiple means of access. I think that was an extremely important lesson for me in, the, in doing this project. I think as designers and artists, we also feel that we can do it all. And I think realizing that, you know, we need as much help as we can get, you know. How many ways can you bring attention to the issue that you're looking at uh, as you're designing or working? So the thing that was really remarkable, this project opened last uh, September, and there were some disappointments with it. There was a, you know, somebody attached a chain to a truck and pulled out a whole bunch of these mirrors in the midsection of the 
six miles, presumably to take the stainless steel, my beautiful stainless steel mirrors for uh, getting some money for uh, turning them in, uh, to have the st stainless uh, recycled. Uh, but one of the things that was really great is that I found out that there are things, the project has been catalytic, there are things that are continuing to happen. Um, there's going to be a White River Festival this fall, another one that's following up. Uh, there are, uh, there's a group of people in the city that have organized something called Row, Reconnecting with Our Waterways. And now I'm working with them and we're applying for another grant from the National Science Foundation to look at the tributaries, uh, six tributaries into the White River in Indianapolis and how to get the community engaged with that. We're doing a, a currency, water currency project uh, project where in the uh, a central city neighborhood uh, we're doing uh, we're designing currency that people will water currency that people will be able to get in exchange for uh, putting in rain barrels or attending classes about how they can do permeable paving or build bioswales in their yard so in other words it really is leading to these uh, other steps. So I'm, I'm just really uh, pleased about that. It has been catalytic. But there are uh, other projects that I'm working on at the same time. And in New York City, I you know, really am interested in working in the place that I live, although I really prefer to work in Indy because it's so much easier to get anything done. Uh, but in New York City, I was asked by the Noguchi Museum to come and look at an area which is actually directly east of the Metropolitan Museum, but it's in Long Island City, where Socrates Sculpture Park and the Noguchi Museum are located. And they wanted to know, uh, they asked four artists to think about what could be done to make this area, to have it develop in a different way. So I said, uh, what if we could uh, think of this as a place that could be a, a research district for people who are, for artists and designers and landscape architects, vis, you know, visual thinkers again, to do test projects. Because one of the hard things in New York City is you can come up with great ideas, but when you go to try and, and do them in the city, they're so worried about liability that you, it's almost impossible to get anything done. So we said, okay, this is a place that's off the beaten track. What if you do some tests here and, and, you know, have a cultural trust that runs interference between all of these departments and the artists. Set up uh, ways for these artists and designers to meet scientists or other experts that they would like to work with. So um, we did some, uh, you know, kind of roughly looked at ideas that might be uh, possible to kind of get people to understand what we were talking about. And there's this big power plant out there. And we said, look, what if you uh, could, you know, this, this, the output of this plant is really causing a lot of asthma in the neighborhood. We said, what if you could kind of, uh, you know, convert this totally negative uh, aspect of these towers and make uh, barometers out of them so that people could see, uh, you know, imagine how are we doing with our water, uh, you know, uh, uh, improving the water or the air or recycling? Uh, so it's kind of like one of those um, uh, barometers that show how many, how mu who's given how much money to the, you know, local uh, campaign uh, for raising money for, you know, I think all of you have seen those things. Anyway, uh, other ideas we were looking at is what if you could take that red and white banding to mark the district uh, and uh, when, as people got there, they would know to start looking for these experiments around that people were building. Um, what if you could take something like in Socrates Sculpture Park, this old uh, container, uh, and turn it into a place where there could be meetings where uh, citizens could meet uh, various experts and hear about new ways to do their uh, gardens or improve, to, to do solar uh, upgrades of their homes in the neighborhood? Or what if you could take something as ubiquitous as scaffolding in the city and turn it into a vertical park? You know, there's scaffolding all over the city. You know, it's just everywhere. But if you went to 
anybody, any city department and said, we think we could make a green space out of the scaffolding, I can guarantee you nobody would let that happen. But we, if you could test it in a neighborhood like this, it would really be great. There are trucks all over Long Island City. What if we uh, turned these into biodiesel trucks and made them studios for these artists and designers to work, to develop ideas, and then take those ideas up to the Bronx or out to Staten Island, drive them around the city and show people new ideas about what they could do, about you know, gardens in their neighborhood or, or whatever. Uh, there are blank walls all over Long Island City. Could we do slices of park up against some of those walls? So we laid all these ideas out. And then there was a second part of the exhibition that happened at Socrates Sculpture Park. And it turns out that Socrates, which is right across the street practically from the Noguchi, was the mouth of Sunswick Creek uh, before it got paved over. And so we did a project um, that kind of tracked Sunswick Creek from its mouth about half mile inland to where it had originated, which uh, currently is a little triangular park called Sixteen Oaks Park. And I'm sure the park is there because it was too boggy to build on. Uh, so it was really interesting to, to find traces of this creek within the existing uh, layout of the community. Uh, we put these uh, reflective uh, dome plastic pieces to uh, indicate where the, the river had been, the creek had been, and uh, there happened to be a, a bunch of old planters uh, around that we uh, put grasses in that might have grown along the river uh, originally. And then in the Sixteen Oaks Park, uh, we actually brought a, a really oversized planter in uh, and showed the plants that might, uh, that could have been there, growing there. And these speech bubbles uh, told something about uh, what had been here. In addition, there was a dial-up as you tracked uh, red and white bands along the street to uh, follow the creek. And the writer, Robert Sullivan, who's really a wonderful writer, wrote a book called Rats, which some of you might have seen, or uh, uh, Meadowlands. Uh, Robert did the one-minute dial-up that you could hear. And they were just wonderful descriptions, talking about how the creek is not gone at all, and to talk about how the creek has engendered a certain kind of, uh, you know, making this into a working neighborhood as these small businesses thrive along the path of, of what had been the creek. Um, so that was one thing in New York City. But then the other thing I, I did was uh, a project uh, I shouldn't say that I did, something I've started, is a project called Broadway 1000 Steps. And this came out of a, a presentation I did about the City as Living Lab and about FLOW, the project at the IMA, um, for city planning. And afterwards, the uh, head of city planning said to me, why don't you do something in New York City? Why just Indianapolis? Nobody's going to notice it if it's just in Indianapolis. Of course, that's a, a very self-centered uh, commissioner of planning, uh, thinks only New York counts. I say only, it only counts if they let you do it, and they let you do it in <laughs> Indianapolis. So anyway, uh, I, I thought about this, and I thought, well, it would be interesting to look at a different kind of corridor. What if you looked at the corridor of Broadway instead of the corridor of the river that we're looking at in Indianapolis? What if you had 20 points along that corridor from the tip of Manhattan to the top of the Bronx, looking at the issues that the city sustainability plan has called out? So I've spent the last two years working my way through bureaucracy, writing grants, uh, developing a toolkit of elements. In this case, we're using convex mirrors. Uh, and these lime green poles. We're thinking of ways we can uh, quantify uh, water use or the miles of pipe in the city so that people can begin to appreciate what's supporting their lives. But the idea is at up to 20 hubs along the corridor that we'd be able to decode the city and reveal something about the relationship of the city to the natural systems that support it. I can tell you, 
New Yorkers do not believe in nature. They think that they are living there by themselves without any support system. Uh, it, I think it never occurs to people to think about where their water is coming from or their energy or the lettuce that they ate. And so instead of trying to you know, lecture people and say, you really, you know, you should be thinking about this. The idea is to catch their attention, you know, just briefly on the street. And, uh, you know, uh, as I was starting to put this out, uh, somebody said, New Yorkers are too busy to uh, uh, take in. There's too much stuff happening on the street that they'll never be noticed. But I have to tell you, New Yorkers are amazing, you know. A new, t a new tennis shoe comes out, new athletic shoe, people no notice. New hairdo, people notice. It spreads like wildfire. So I really believe in the, uh, in the ability of people to really take information in. Uh, we were going to do some modest uh, elements on the ground to let people as a way of pointing things out to people. And we did a test installation up at 137th Street a year ago uh, where we tried to see what was working and what wasn't working. It was really helpful. Uh, we found out that if you could directly reflect something and, and tell people about it, it was much more effective than uh, if it was just an abstract uh, thing that was being noted. And then on uh, an opening day, we had about uh, six different people come and meet with the people in the community that were hanging out in the park to talk to them about the history of the place, the ecology. Somebody came from the, uh, tran the uh, Trans Canada, the power company. Um, uh, there was also, uh, in the background, you'll see uh, the woman in the blue, Heather Hart. Uh, part of the idea with this project is that I'm really trying to start something, uh, initiate an incremental change of Broadway that could happen with artists and designers doing projects along that corridor that, you know, different, uh, how could we get composting happening along the corridor in many different neighborhoods that communities would accept? How could you let people know if there's a green roof? How could you let people know how often the edge of the island has changed when you're down at Bowling Green? Uh, but one of the things uh, we wanted to do in this day when we invited people to the, uh, this installation is have another artist uh, do something. And so Heather Hart said, look, food is really an important issue in this neighborhood, food accessibility and availability. Let's do a recipe exchange. And so we created uh, recipe cards uh, with our recipe for paella in both Spanish and English, since it was a Dominican neighborhood. And uh, we also came up with bling. And if people uh, gave us a recipe, they got bling and the uh, our paella recipe. And we collected about 100 recipes, which we are putting together to distribute to the community. And the idea was, instead of telling people that they're going to get heart disease or diabetes, we wanted to uh, give them some new ideas of what to cook. But it was uh, Heather's idea that initiated this. But I just, I, this, I wanted to show this as the next step that I was thinking about. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, if we want to imagine how you can show New York is changing, how you can uh, show in a very short period of time that it's no longer just the home of Wall Street, it's no longer just a 19th, 20th century city, I thought, what if we could along the whole corridor of Broadway, paint the roofs white and uh, have people see that the city is becoming a different kind of place. And imagine that those white roofs would proliferate and that the whole city would become a city of white roofs. So this is my fantasy of what I, I get to do next. And I, I guess you can tell from all of these things that I'm showing you, I have a pretty rich fantasy life. I can't imagine actually getting every, uh, building owner along this corridor to do this, but it, it, it could happen. Um, so I, I just I want to stop there. Uh, um, I want to kind of circle back around and say once again that um, I hope that the thing that you can get out of this, that I, you know, these things I'm talking about, is what an important role you all can play in the future 
I, I just really would love you to all take yourselves as, as just as seriously as you possibly can. Don't let anybody tell you that this, you know, that architecture, landscape architecture, is anything less than a vital part of our, uh, of our future. Cities need us. Communities need us. We've got to, we're the ones who can make things visceral, tangible, accessible to people. Um, but I'd like to see if any of you have any questions. One, one question. Uh -huh. I never came back to it. Yeah. Uh, so the um, project that was installed as a temporary installation, the test of the Broadway 1000 steps, uh, we did have a very serious evaluation. It was up for three months. And uh, this environmental psychologist came in, interviewed people before the installation was up and then repeatedly during the period of the installation. What they found out was that people did pay attention to these uh, things, uh, that they did do the dial-ups, that they did it more as it was up for a longer period of time, and that it did have an effect. You know, it's such a weird thing as, a, as an artist. I'm used to somebody saying, ah, it's no good because we don't like it or, you know, but it's, it was, I think, both the experience of finding that the evaluator found that the work was effectual, and then in, in Indy, finding that these other things are coming out of the work, these other initiatives, has been so uh, heartening to me that it's not just my imagination, you know, my thinking, oh, we, you know, we'll do this, we'll have this effect. Um, I think it's really important to. Uh, I think as a way to prove to people that what we're doing uh, has some value. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that these collaborations that I'm doing with scientists and engineers are extremely important in another way, and that is that money has almost completely dried up within the cultural sphere. Uh, grants are so few and far between, and the amount of money that's available through National Science Foundation grants or NOAA grants, you know, a $50,000 grant is huge in the art context. 250000 is small in National Science Foundation uh, framework. It's not easy to get these grants, but I think it's really um, an important thing. But that's, that's where the evaluation comes in, improving that what you're doing has some effect. Uh, how do you deal with something being, yeah, uh, how do you, uh, when you're working on a project and then it's eliminated, you cry, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh no. Uh, it's just, it's heartbreaking, it's really heartbreaking. And I think that the kind of work that I'm trying to do now, which is much more modest in its scale, I just, I have to find a way to have, uh, to be effective, you know, I can't just, continually have these things canceled. I spent about 20 years having the majority of the projects canceled because of funding at the last minute. However, it is always teaching you more so that, you know, you're, it's not as though you're not gaining from it, but it's, uh, it's really, it's hard. Yes? What kind of staff do I have in my studio? It really varies. Uh, this past year, I've had about eight people in the studio w working on the project, uh, doing community uh, outreach, uh, working on the f uh, fabrication details, working on the content development uh, of Broadway, um, you know, being the office manager. Uh, I have an executive director. I've just become a nonprofit, the City is Living Laboratory. So there's somebody who's spending a lot of time going out fundraising. Um, fundraising is lower now, uh, so there are fewer people working in the studio, and it just, it's a cycle. 
Sometimes there are two and sometimes eight. Yes, uh, they're, they're almost all architects or landscape architects or urban designers because I, I always try and have the, at least the office manager be an artist so I'm not the only one in the studio, but uh, the skills that I need, uh, you know, computer skills and things like that are usually from the design arts. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Also, also, I would like to recognize uh, the help, uh, the magic of uh, Carol Street that made this lecture possible. Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, finally, uh, also please remember, uh, we're all invited at uh, 6 uh, this evening at the EV and uh, Bertha Ball Center uh, for our reception. Uh, with Mary, where you will have, uh, again, the opportunity of sharing with her. So hope to see you there. Thank you very much for coming.